Hi, and welcome to another episode of Shame Plays Geek Talk, a journey into the things we love. Thanks so much for pressing play. This episode, we have uh, Chris Holmes, who is the son of John Eric Holmes. John Eric Holmes uh, is known for several things, but the two things that we probably would know him best for is uh, fans of this show would be uh, he was the author slash editor of the first D&D basic set in 1977. And he also did a lot of fiction writing, uh, probably would be characterized as pulp fiction writing uh, in the Edgar Rice Burroughs uh, playground. And then also uh, in Buck Rogers. So, but he's also a, a neurologist and all kinds of other cool things. And Chris uh, keeps the, the torch alive for his father, championing his work and making sure that the legacy is known. Uh, and then also Chris does really cool stuff in his own right, including art and a very cool day job uh, that involves D&D that uh, we'll, we'll talk about on this episode. Some other things uh, that uh, you'll hear today is uh, he's got a posthumous RPG project with his father coming out from Pacesetter Games called Things Better Left Alone. Um, you'll definitely hear more about that. Uh, we also get into how much did John Eric Holmes make for creating the first D&D Basic Edition. I think you'll be surprised by the answer. Uh, Chris and Shane, that would be me, have different approaches to playing with alignment in RPGs. Uh, what's Chris's favorite D&D edition? And that's a trick answer. Uh, also, we do talk about Edgar Rice Burroughs, and we talk about sending in the Pinkertons. That's a... a uh, Topic of interest in RPGs at the moment due to uh, something Wizards of the Coast did. We talk about Tarzan superpower. Yes, Chris makes the case that Tarzan had one of the first superpowers. We also talk about were sharks, Ask Cthulhu, zombie movies, Rob Zombie, Dragula, and Sherlock Holmes, and much, much more. Uh, don't forget uh, the, our previous episode. We had returning friend of the show, uh, Neil Halford. Uh, talks about the betrayal at Crondor 30th anniversary, very well-known, beloved fantasy uh, CRPG based on Raymond E. Feist's Crondor uh, books. Uh, and there's also a fan film challenge related to that. So make sure to check that out. All right. So without any further ado, let's get on with this episode. On with the show. Shall, shall, shall we play a game? Why, Yes. I believe we shall. Oh, I got a live one here. <laughs> Getting geeky all up in your podcasts. It's Shane Plays Geek Talk, a journey into the things we love. I'm your host, Shane Stacks. Thanks so much for tuning in. As always, I have a very cool guest. This guest has the patience of a saint. We've been talking probably about a year, if not longer, uh, about having him on and he has rolled with the punches and I appreciate it very much, but I'm just at really pleased to finally have Chris Holmes on who, uh, I've gotten to know Chris through, uh, North Texas RPG con, but he's got, um, uh, he's, his feet are very firmly into the, uh, the D and D world RPG world. <laughs> And he's got some really cool stuff to share. So, Chris Holmes, welcome to Shane Place. Thank you very much, Shane. Well, since uh, since we first talked about having me on the show, I now have two things to promote instead of one. So, <laughs> yeah, it's exciting. Works out so, pretty well. Yeah, I just I'm going to go ahead and get the um, th this out of the way because I think a lot of times when people talk to you one of their main points of interest is the fact of who your father is. And that oh, is interesting really? to me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? Shocker. Uh, <laughs> and that is interesting to me, but I think also you're doing some very interesting stuff in your own right. So I want to talk about that as well, but let's just go ahead and address, uh, educate the audience. If they don't already know that, uh, that your father is John Eric Holmes, uh, J Eric Holmes. He, he went by different, uh, names, uh, who did the Holmes basic D&D &D set in 1977, but was also did a lot of fiction writing, uh, pulp writing and that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, the more yes. I've researched your father, 
very interesting guy, uh, was a neurosurgeon and a Marine. Um, <laughs> so, you know, did a lot. Um, but, you know, um, actually, to, to a neurologist, he didn't actually do the surgery. Uh, okay. Yeah, so he, he could prescribe to you, but he would not uh, open your brain as but far as I know. He didn't actually go in and touch touch the brain. Okay. Well, still that's, that's pretty <laughs> fascinating. So unless you were dead, then he might touch your brain. <laughs> <laughs> he might, he might touch your brain. He might play with your <laughs> tissue. Um, so, uh, and, and, you know, he actually, I was looking, he wrote nonfiction articles for analog, like, uh, something about tapeworms. And he had all these nonfiction, uh, uh neurology related articles for, for analog and, and, and other magazines. So, and, and one of the things we're going to talk about today is that it's a project that you're sort of doing posthumously, a joint project with your father, that there is a module that um, Pace Setter Games, Bill Barsh, Ben Barsh, those guys are going to drop starting June 1st. In fact, I think it's going to be available at North Texas RPG Con and then, and then by their website and whatever, et cetera. But it is a module based on some maps that your father drew. And then also you're contributing some art. That's right. It's a, that, it's based on yeah, my that's father's exciting. first dungeon. So there will be were sharks and uh, Dagon may uh, appear and kill you at the end. And you it's could, called yeah, Dagon uh, and Were Sharks. Things so, better left alone. And I saw the cover. Oh, the title is is uh, something from the uh, sample dungeon in in Holmes Basic. Uh, it, it may have been something my father actually quoted from Lovecraft. I'm not sure. That sounds like a Lovecraft thing. Yeah. yeah. Like the Lovecraft could be summed up. The Lovecraft anthology could be don't poke it. Things <laughs> better left alone. Don't yes. poke it. Please don't poke it. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I found a wonderful picture uh, from one of the early, I think it was Gen Cons, where – there was some kind of banquet where it was like Tim Cask, your father, your mom, and you. It's like an old mm -hmm. black and white, or not black and white, but an old photo, and you're just smiling big. Um, <laughs> and I think, Tim Cask. I think it was in a, yeah, Tim Cask. Um, yeah, he was, was making like us a very laugh. early. Yeah, yeah. So you guys were were that's wonderful. So you've got you you've gotten to see a side of D and D and TRSR history that you know a lot of us. Um, didn't have. And um, it, it could be argued, and I think it could be argued successfully, that your father was a major part of the process that brought D&D &D to the mainstream. Hmm. Uh, with the, I don't know about major, but sure, he was there. Yeah, yeah, he was there. I mean, he was a major league. <laughs> well, he was, you know, he did the, the, the um, it could be, and I read people speculating on this and i agree with them that that home's basic D, D set was the first sort of mainstream D, D product uh you know you can argue what mainstream is um mm -hmm. but you know it went to retailers right so uh, yeah it was it, it was yeah. much more accessible than the the three own booklets i would say it had a really nice looking box with a Pretty Dragon on right. the cover by Sutherland. And I think my dad's writing style helped, uh, particularly people who hadn't played war games before, understand what they were, were reading. <laughs> so they didn't have to be initiated. So uh, I'm looking at the, of course, you have the, the, a lot of people think that the first basic set was the um, Moldve. Uh, which was like 1981 or something like that. The actual first basic set of D and D was 1977. And it's got a dragon on the front setting on a, I think there's a couple of different versions of the cover art. One of them is kind of blue tinged. And I think some later well, the booklet inside like, is blue tinged. Oh, uh, the booklet's blue tinged, but the box was always. Yeah. Color. Yeah. Okay. The box was full. Color. That, yeah. So it's called the blue right, book that, because most people, their box got disintegrated before anything else. So then they just carried the blue booklet. They still with have them the book. Sometimes that yeah. disintegrated too. <laughs> right. Uh, and then, so the cover was, uh, the box was color, cover or color. Uh, the booklet inside was a blue tinged cover. Um, 
dragon setting on a pile of gold with some adventurers confronting the dragon. Um, mm-hmm. And this is also why there is an OSR retro clone of this version of D&D called Blue Home. Uh, that's literally the name of it in, you know, in honor of, of uh, both homes and I guess the cover, the, the color of the booklet. Um, and then on the very first page, there's a very nice, I like this. I love this. It says for Jeff and Chris. So we know who Chris is. Who is Jeff? So Jeff is my older brother, and he was the one who introduced my father and I to Dungeons and Dragons. So his uh, ah. high school uh, friends at the alternative school in uh, Santa Monica were playing it, and uh, so uh, when he learned about it, he was like, "Oh, my dad's going to love this." So uh, these high schoolers taught dad, dad and I too. how to play, and uh, they they thought uh, we were all going to die. Perhaps. So they made us roll up three characters and uh, we played and none of us died. But I stuck with those three characters for years afterwards. <laughs> the third one always died. He was like the drummer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. He was the drummer. But for Boinger and Zereth, so- the, uh, the Hobbit and the uh, elf uh, survived and became uh, literary characters, actually. Oh, so Boinger yeah. and Zareth were your characters. They were, yeah. So I'm a co-creator okay. as, <laughs> to some extent. All right. Yeah, if people research uh, your father's fiction writing, there's a whole series of short stories and one novel, a thing called The Maze of Peril, featuring Boinger the Halfling and uh, his companion, Zareth. Was she an elf? Uh, he's a... I was- um, <laughs> he's sort of a non-sexual male elf, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I, so Zareth Boinger is, is very okay. heterosexual. Uh, Zareth is is still. Uh, we still don't know about Zareth. We have to write some more stories about him. Zareth is still exploring. Okay, so um, <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So and then it, and then it says uh, rules for fantastic medieval role playing adventure game campaigns. So. Uh, but to to bring it back to the because I did want I did want to make sure to talk about this since it's relevant and timely. The in in the Holmes basic set, there is a a sample dungeon or there's a couple of there's some uh, starting on page forty. Uh, there's a sample dungeon and a couple of sample maps to go along with this dungeon or at least one. Uh, I thought there was more than one. Let me look. I thought, yeah, there is. There's sort of a cross section on page 38, and then on page yeah, I think uh, Tom Wham forty one cross section. Okay, pretty cool. According to Bill Barsh, uh, in a Facebook post, let me see if I have that pulled up. All right, so this is from Bill Barsh on April twentieth. He said, "Today, I moved my workstation to the kitchen table to celebrate." The manuscript for the J. Eric Holmes dungeon is complete. If you missed the previous post on the subject, I'll refresh quickly. Chris Holmes, son of John Eric Holmes, approached Pacesetter Games uh, with the opportunity to take an original pencil-drawn map from his father and create an actual adventure module. So Bill says it couldn't uh, reply fast enough. So, uh, see, so I've been working together on this. Uh, they've they've written encounters to go along with this uh, this map that your father drew. And uh, mm-hmm. on June first, there is a a adventure dropping uh, called Th- "Things Better Left Alone," um, which which you've already touched on, and it, that's even in the in the, in the old um, Holmes basic set. Your father, I think, even calls it "Things Better Left Alone." Um, mm-hmm. So, which is a great name. Don't poke it, but adventurers <laughs> being adventurers, they're going to poke it. So uh, let me see. Here's some other stuff that Bill sent me. I reached out to him about it. He said there's 113 keyed encounters, uh, read aloud player text and all, maps based on the Maze of Peril book, which is a uh, Maze of Peril is, a, is an actual novel featuring your characters, Boinger and, uh, and his male elf companion. 
<laughs> we added about 15 to 20 new monsters and 10 new magic items. So this drops June 1st. Uh, if you're at, if people are at North Texas, evidently you can pick it up from uh, Pace Setter Games at North Texas. Uh, it, it'll also be available via their website. Sounds really cool. I'm definitely going to pick up a copy. Uh, so this is a previous map that your father drew, but was never f- fully fleshed out. So now uh, Pace Setter Games is fle- has fleshed it out with encounters and whatnot, and you're contributing art. That's right. I have to finish uh, drawing a were shark this weekend. The were shark. So does it. the were sh- <laughs> Does the were shark knock on doors and claim to be a dolphin? And then if you open the door, he eats you. It it could could be the the thing about were sharks that uh, was really important at the time uh, I first encountered them was that they we thought they were normal sharks and then they climbed out of the water to kill us. Uh, we thought we were safe on the beach, uh, but we were not. <laughs> and uh, my big dwarf, who is my my third character was the first uh, first victim of a were shark ever. And what was his name? So we can Im- memorialize well, Bardan. him. Bardan. <laughs> Poor Bardan. Bardan. He, he shows up <laughs> in the novel too, briefly. So but, uh, if, not last if you get bit, if you get bit by a were shark and survive, do you turn into a were shark? I would assume so. Yeah. My dad never but wrote at the high actual... tide. <laughs> yeah. So there's different stats for them. Uh, Gary Gygax appropriated them in the uh, Monster Manual too, but other people have written different stats for them. My dad never really wrote out the rules for them. He just uh, he wrote a um, a short little uh, snippet of an adventure for Alarms and Excursions, and that is where I believe Gary Gygax read about them the first time. But they're now in Maze Apparel, and they're now in this module as well. So how long, I mean, are are they like a land shark? Can they run around on land indefinitely? I think so. But they, I mean, they're monsters, uh, Shane, so you can can have them do whatever you like. Some people actually play them as a character class, which I don't know if I approve of, but they're weird Players will be players. Yes. (laughs) Players will play anything. Um, so, so here's the most important thing about a were shark. I have to know: mm-hmm. Does it thirst for human blood? <laughs> I I think so. Yeah. You know, he did. Uh, my father did grow up in Hawaii, and he did hear some Hawaiian uh, folk uh, folk tales and stuff when he was a kid or a teenager. So he did sort of appropriate them from a. Um, you know, a native source in a sense. Uh, there is right. a shark man in uh, Hawaiian folklore, which is kind of cool, I think. But that is pretty cool. So, so we've got we've got things better left alone, aka don't poke it. That's what I'm calling it. That's not the official name. Things better left alone is the official name. Drops June first, and there may be, if you're lucky, a were shark. So tell us about the art that you're doing for, and tell us about your art in general. Um, Cause like I said, we're not just talking about your father. Tell, what, what, tell us what you get up to. <laughs> well, I do have a day job, <laughs> but uh, I, um, yes, I like to draw monsters and I've been doing it since I was a teenager. And uh, I had my first drawing printed in the, uh, illustrating a Boinger and Zerath story, Troll's Head. Uh, but um, I was always a, a little late to the um, Dungeons and Dragons party uh, with my art. So I, so I had a couple of um, successes early and then a couple of rejections or it being ignored. And I kind of gave up on it for many years. But um, when Alan uh, approached me to, want to do a collection of dad's stories, I said, yeah, let's do it. And I'd like to draw an illustration for each one of the stories as well. And he said, yeah, do that. So I picked up my pen again, uh, at the age of 50 something. And, uh, and now I'm, uh, doing drawings for lots of different people. And I, I'm at the point where I have to start charging for everything. So 
I think well, the last that's, drawing that's I did good, for man. free was for was for Levi. Uh, Levi Combs of Planet X Games. Yeah. Uh, did you do? Well, he do said he said I could draw scenes? any monster. Yeah, I did a drawing for a zine. He said I could draw any monster I wanted, and he would write, uh, uh, you know, a little description of it, and uh, and you know, turn it into a uh, a playable monster. So that was a an offer I could draw? not refuse. <laughs> yeah, what did you draw? <laughs> Something from my childhood. Uh, it's called a lobarilla. It's part gorilla, <laughs> part lobster. I'm there. I, I'm there for that. <laughs> yeah, that is that is that's that's fantastic. Um, yeah. That's, that's in hey, one of that's, the phylacteries. I love it. So, and you mentioned Alan earlier. I'm assuming that's Alan Groey of uh, mm-hmm. Black Blade yes. Publishing. Yeah, who you've done some work with. Yeah, and they, he published the collection of your father's works. So, well, that's fantastic, man. Uh, that not only are you drawing, uh, pursuing a love, but making money for it. Nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. So, is there are there any other people you're working with right now, or projects that you want to mention that you're involved with? Well, the uh, the old news, I guess, now is um, that uh, my father's uh, Pellucidar novel, his sequel to uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs' Pellucidar series, Mahars of Pellucidar, has been re-released by Edgar Rice Burroughs Incorporated, and they've also released Red Axe of Pellucidar, which was never printed before officially, in uh, lovely editions with a, a little drawing by Chris Holmes on inside. Oh, and, that's uh, great. Now, Pelu- Pelucidar, Pelucidar, that's the inner world of Mars, right? It's like the hollow earth of Mars, or am I... It's the hollow I'm earth saying, of Earth. <laughs> oh, so I actually, thought it was on Mars. Okay. No, it's on Earth. Uh, it's it's based on some crazy uh, uh, writings of Madame Bolavsky, a theosophist, and also uh, Jules Verne's uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth. But it has a... There's a sun inside of our Earth, and then there's a, a, a hollow world on the inside full of dinosaurs and uh, intelligent right. reptiles. And yeah, Tarzan that visited. Up. That kind of thing pops up a lot. Oh, Tarzan visited. Well, of course he did. Yeah, that was the first um, crossover novel ever written was Tarzan at the Earth's Core. Did Burroughs write that? Who yeah, yeah. That? Burroughs wrote, yeah, okay. Burroughs wrote eight, 80 Tarzan books and... Uh, Seven Pellucidar books, and maybe he wanted to give his Pellucidar series a little bump or something. So, so um, he had Tarzan. So Tarzan, yeah, yeah, Tarzan gets into a dirigible, and they fly through the polar opening, and uh, they encounter uh, s- snake people or lizard people, and uh, it's a great book, Tarzan at the Earth's Core. Yeah, there's, you know, I read a couple of years ago. Um, I think I got it from Troll Lord Games. They issue some Tarzan books, some older, they do reissues of stuff. But I read Tarzan for the first time. Mm-hmm. And it was way different than what, as, as often happens when your understanding of a character is based on movie adaptations. And then you actually read the book. It's quite different. So, um, yeah, Tarzan's a different character. Then I mean, by the end of he's wearing suits and running around speaking French and stuff, taking his revenge on people in Europe. So, um, yeah. So uh, anyway, um, he he does wear suits so, in the Tarzan novels occasionally, but he loves ripping them off and being naked too. So of course he does because he's <laughs> he's the primal viral or virile man. So uh, <laughs> yes. yeah, and then I have I've got a buddy Michael Tierney who works with the. Uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs estate. Is it a foundation? Um, uh, I, I can't remember know, the official. A corporation, official. I think. Uh, he, yeah, they're very nice people. Them. Yeah, well, he works with them, and he's he's done the chronology of, of artwork related to Edgar Rice Burroughs. But he also got to finish one of Edgar Rice Burroughs' uh, Tarzan stories that was unfinished. It was called um, Tarzan and the Mysterious She. And and I mm-hmm. guess it was a short story that, or maybe a novelette, novella that uh, ERB never finished. So with the approval of the foundation, he finished it, and uh, that was published in Kursova magazine, which Kursova is cool. an advertising partner of Shame Place. See how I worked all that in? 
<laughs> yeah, Kursova no, magazine, C I R S O V A, <laughs> Kursova magazine. So anyway, uh, so you got to do some illustrations for the reissues. You got to do some illustrations for um, the Growy, the Black Blade Publishing. Uh, collection of your father's work. You did some stuff for Levi Combs. Um, what, anything, anything else you want to mention? Uh, I don't know. I'm probably going to pitch a few things at the next convention, but no, nothing, uh, nothing solid yeah. yet. But I've got. I made a lot of great friends there. Um, oh, so thanks oh, again to Alan. North Texas. Yes. Yeah. But if you uh, if you want to uh, poke Alan and and Black Blade Publishing, and because um, uh, Tales of Peril is out of print, so why don't they make print some more? Yeah, I, I think we should. I think we should form a picket line at the Black Blade <laughs> Publishing booth at <laughs> North Texas, and we can just we'll we'll have a sign, you know, Black Blade unfair, uh, all that, and we'll just march back and forth. <laughs> poor poor Alan, he's like the nicest guy in the world. Uh, so <laughs> he's, his, he's his, close, his son, yeah. <laughs> I blew his son Henry up in a game last last year. So mm-hmm. I was running Middle Earth <laughs> role playing, and and uh, he crawled down a tunnel that was full of uh, black powder, and it blew up. So, but he seemed kind of happy that that's how things ended. So I don't know. Oh yeah, it's, um, it's fun to die in a convention <laughs> game. Yeah, exactly right. It, especially if it's spectacular. You're like, this was a big yes. eruption of black powder. Yeah, so <laughs> things went boom. Yeah, so I think everybody was happy all around. Um, well, that's great, man. I, I, I like to draw, too. I, I, I never really thought I had any artistic ability. And then about four years ago, I started doing Inktober. I don't know if you're familiar mm-hmm. with that or not. but it's uh, So I do Inktober during October, and then I do the Inktober 52, where you do one, one a week all year round. And it's fun to watch my drawing improve. I've actually drawn stuff, and I'm like, I, I did that? So, uh, which is nice. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, I've been drawing for f- over 50 years. <laughs> I've been drawing for over 50 years, and I haven't seen much improvement yet. But I'm getting faster. No, yeah. like I show well, that's you, improvement. If you look at what I did when I was what sixteen, my first drawing, you go, "Wow, you, that guy's really talented." And then you look at what I just did, and you go, "Wow, that's the same guy. He's still a teenager. <laughs> He's still drawing tiny little hatch marks." <laughs> but you did it. You did. You did it much faster. So who is? Yeah, a little faster. I'm, I'm on. Yeah. All right. So you have a website, HolmesWest.com. Oh I'll yeah, look I in do. The show notes. Yeah, and there's you have some art up on your website. Uh, who is who is it? Snoggy the snail, Snoggy, Shoggy, Snoggy <laughs> snail. <laughs> I don't think we need to promote that. <laughs> I was out of town, and my wife just started taking pictures of my art, sort of randomly. So yes, <laughs> Sno- sure, let's call him Snoggy the snail. Yeah, uh, I love that you have. Uh, you have artwork of kaiju. You've got like Hedora versus Gamera versus Mothra. That's cool. Yeah, that was a, a painting I did for my wife. <laughs> oh, is she a kaiju fan? Yeah, she's a Mothra fan. Yeah, yeah, Mothra. I'm a, I'm a big kaiju, and I like Mothra too. Every time Mothra shows up on screen, I have to sing the Mothra song. You've got yeah, an you interesting <laughs> range of art because. Some of your stuff is like OSR kind of gritty, you know, mm-hmm. old school sort of. But then some of it is like almost uh, cartoony and whimsical. So you've got well, a, you've got you. a pretty wide range. Yeah, you've got uh, mm-hmm. you got a very wide range here. So um, and it looks like do you do some sculpting? It looks like maybe you did some stuff with clay or uh, uh, I see, yeah, I see I, a picture um, of some stuff here on it. Yeah. Well, I got from uh, actually from Dungeons and Dragons, I got into theater and from theater, I got into mask making and from mask making, I got into puppet making briefly and then I got into painting theater and then I got into designing scenery for theater. But I have it at various times made props for plays and things. So uh, like I made a nice. Jabberwocky head for Alice through the looking glass. So that might have been uh, the, the sculpture thing you saw might have been my my Jabberwocky head. Uh, I bet I was, I'm really good at fake food. Are you? 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that's important for plays, right? I mean, <laughs> Sometimes. So, uh, so every time you touch the Jabberwock head or Jabberwocky head, do you say snicker snack? <laughs> well, it's really high in the corner of my <laughs> room, so I don't. Uh, actually, its teeth are very <laughs> vulnerable now. They. Uh, whatever plastic I made them with is sort of decayed, so I can't really touch it yeah. as much as I would like. <laughs> so it, its teeth are decaying, so it's had too many Snickers snacks? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> you guess so? All right, but I'm dumb. All right. So you you were talking about earlier that you had a day job, and we were talking before we started recording that uh, your hobby, your love of role-playing games intersects, intersects, intersects sometimes <laughs> with your um uh, with your day job why don't you tell us a little That's bit about true. that yeah well i work with teenagers at the boys and girls club and uh part of my job is uh, being a dungeon master <laughs> actually today i get to go be a player because my high school uh, group uh they're actually each of them has created their own version of dungeons and dragons so they're they're taking turns running the game and i'm just a player and i Tell them not to use bad language and not to bully each other. But basically, I'm just playing Dungeons and Dragons and getting paid a little bit for it. <laughs> I also play chess uh, and you're living uh, the dream. pool and Cosmic Encounter and other games. And I do teach a little bit of art. That that's all around just super cool. Uh, would you say that? So the kid, the teenagers you're playing D and D with, or even chess mm-hmm. or whatever. Uh, <laughs> Do they, I, I mean, are they, are they, are they kids that you would say, I don't normally think they'd be into D and D, but then once they start playing it, they enjoy it. Or do, do you get kids gravitating that you think would normally be interested in D and D anyway? How does that kind of work? Uh, there, some of them actually have, have played fifth edition already and others have just heard about it. So, um, no, uh, I don't ever force anyone to play Dungeons & Dragons, so I just try to seem like fun. And uh, uh, maybe I tempt them by giving them their own uh, little bag of dice. That that might, but yes, just, they might like that. Mm-hmm. So if, That's if, usually if, a good... So if you kill one of their characters, do they try to get you fired? <laughs> I, uh, it's, it took me like two years before I actually <laughs> killed a character. Um, oh, okay. Because I give them lots of opportunities to, uh, to think better of their choices, but yeah. Right. <laughs> we, we brought him back to life eventually. All right. So do you try to work in like, cause your job is to work with teenagers at the boys and girls club, mm-hmm. right? So, uh, do you try to work in like life lessons or do you just let the game be the game? Well, uh, I do in a sense that um, moral th- questions do occur, and um, I don't actually play with alignment, so I allow each sort of a moral situation to work itself out. And uh, if you happen to be a cleric or a paladin, then God may uh, take an interest in what's going on. But sometimes just I try to put social pressure on you not to kill each other off. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but we always have a good time. So that's interesting. Since you brought up alignment, I'm going to push in a little bit there because yeah. that, you know, alignment, I, I, in fact, if I remember right, your father's alignment system is a little bit different. If I remember like a five point alignment system, if I remember right, I'd, I'd have to go refresh myself. Um, that's all right. But what do you, like, do you not play with alignment at Boys and Girls Club just because you don't want to get into all that? Or do you personally just prepare to or prefer to dispense with alignment in general in your games? Or yes, is it just the yes, Boys and Girls I just, Club? No, it's just not on the character sheets of any game I ever play. I don't okay. I think it's unnecessary. But I mean if you're if you are a cleric or if you're a samurai or whatever, you have a code and you should follow it. Yeah. But the rest yeah. of us, we have to just sort of fumble along. You know, you kill someone who's trying to kill you, but uh, you have to decide, right. you know, should I kill this monster? Yeah, it's a monster. Let's take its treasure. But right. should I kill this child who's picking my pocket? I don't know. Yeah, probably not. Maybe just cut his hand <laughs> off. No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Teach him a lesson. I just, yeah, teach that. 
wacky kid a lesson. I, I find the alignment, and I won't, I won't, I won't spend too much time on this, but I find the alignment discussion interesting because on one side, you know, you can say, hey, you don't want to force morality or the lack thereof in a game, codify it. Okay, fair enough. You know, let the player's actions determine what alignment they are. On the other hand, it's interesting to me, not in the real world, obviously, but in a fantasy world, right? That could have a completely different origin, uh, creation, whatever, than the real world. That the idea of good and evil and neutrality even could actually be part of the cosmological forces that underlie the entire foundation of reality. So I don't, I don't, mm. I don't necessarily have a problem with alignment in a game like, you know, cause you could literally have a fantasy universe where good and evil are forces like gravity, right? Um, mm. They're just baked in. Uh, but I also have no problem with people dispensing with alignment um, and saying, yeah, it's, it's, it's just not sort of how you feel about gods in your, in your um, right. universe too, whether they're, are they fighting each other? Uh, you know, are they trying right. to uh, win over converts or whatever? Or um, I usually don't have gods in my game unless the player wants to have a god. Then I then I say, right. okay, tell me a little bit about your god or whatever. Generally, they want to have a Christian god, so I just let them uh, sort of dictate how they're going to deal with that. And, uh, so let me let me drill in on that. When you say a Christian god, like they want their god in the game to actually be like God, like Jehovah, or well, they don't talk about it, but they're like they just and you know they they say, "Can I ask God for ad- advice?" Okay, like, so they just say God. Okay, all right. Yeah. So they're not they're not necessary. They're just saying God in the general sense of how modern Western society would say God. I guess that's interesting. I've never had a player do that. I mean, every player does it differently. A lot of people like myself, I, I don't really want to play a cleric. Uh, I, it doesn't seem right. like fun to me. I want to play a thief or or <laughs> some other cool, you know, pointy-eared character. But um, so uh, if a, if my, my player wants to ask God for help, I have them roll 3d6. And if they roll under their wisdom, then maybe God will... Uh, will uh, listen to their prayer or listen to their question. Well, and, uh, and then sometimes if they do something really bad, I sometimes say, do you think uh, God uh, wants you to do that? <laughs> and then that usually uh, makes them think twice. <laughs> well, that's, that's kind of where I, and then and I'll wrap up the alignment discussion. Cause uh, you know, that's, sure. that's easy no, to I, rabbit hole on this, but <laughs> I think that, I, I think a lot of it comes down to if a player is like, I want to be like a paladin or a cleric with, and I want to follow a deity that has these strictures, then I'll hold them to it. But I don't yeah, put sure. it, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't force it on them. Like I've had players that say, I'm, you know, chaotic good and I follow this deity and, or, or I'm neutral good or whatever. And then they tell me what it's all about. And then they proceed to play completely opposite of that. I'm like, okay. <laughs> they they start having in-game consequences. Like suddenly they're getting disadvantaged a lot or they're having bad dreams that they can't remember. They just feel out of sorts. Um, something's not right. Something's off, you know. But I don't come out and say it's because you declared yourself this and you've been doing this repeatedly, you know. Mm-hmm. Um you let them. So that, that's kind of how I handle. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's good. I like that. I like that. Yeah, you you told me you wanted to play this way, so. <laughs> um, and another thing on alignment, and this is the last thing I'll say. I, I I never play evil characters. I don't play in evil parties. But it's fascinating to me to watch movies or read stories or whatever where like basically everybody's evil. And how do they make that work? Like, what's their common interest or their common rules to keep them from turning on each other i think that's very interesting um like a like a lot yeah, i don't think it would work <laughs> yeah I, not forever but if you have a short-term common goal so <laughs> uh you know that they all they all have shared interest in in reaching or whatever so uh well i think that's super cool that that you do the stuff at the um 
Boys and Girls Club, and not not just D and D. I mean, playing chess and, and pool and all that. It just being involved so important, man. Mm-hmm. So that's that's super groovy. And um, and being away from your phone. Uh, yeah, because we don't. That's important. We don't take away their phones uh, when they're teenagers. We we try to entice them to interact uh, in any other way. <laughs> but, right. Yeah, there's. It's interesting that you mentioned that because. Uh, like I've got, I've got a niece who like she's in high school and she basically dated a guy for like two years, hardly ever saw him. Mm. All the dating was happening by like text message. So they have, you know, uh, and, and I notice a lot of, a lot of kids these days aren't as, uh, fired up to get a driver's license. Like when I was in high That's school, true. like you turned 16, you wanted that driver's license. And I've noticed a trend here lately that kids are less interested in getting that drivers because they could stay in touch with their friends on their phone. So um, I've noted I've, that's something I've noticed anyway. So, but that's a whole different uh, <laughs> conversation. I'm gonna I'm gonna steer it back to D and D. So, uh, <laughs> so um, do you play any role playing games besides D and D? At at conventions, yeah. Um. Whenever well, I can, I yeah, can. actually, I just I can answer my own question. I know that you like Tecamel, <laughs> like I like Tecamel, right? We're both Tecamel heads, so yes, yeah. Hey, you know what Jeff Jeff D told me once? What's that? Uh, that that uh, Empire of the Petal Throne and the planet Tecamel uh, is uh, was inspired by Barsoom, the creation of Edgar Rice Burroughs, because uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs is Mars is is a, is a uh, is a planet inhabited by multi-limbed monstrous creatures with a sense of honor and a lot of uh, very attractive people who don't wear a lot of clothing. And uh, yeah, so, that's yeah. the, I that's can see Tecumel. that. <laughs> yeah. The thing with Tecumel though, it has so many different influences. I mean, I can definitely see that. Uh, oh yeah. It has, it's, a, it's got it a lot. Has some yeah. Very interesting influences. Yeah. Yeah, it's the the deeper I dig into Tecamel, Empire of the Petal, Petal Throne, etc. Um, uh, it's just it's just fascinating to me. You know, I play the games. I've read a couple of the books. Uh, reading, it's just rich. And uh, you know, I've, I brought this point up with Victor Raymond, and who's who's uh, on the Tecamel Foundation, and a couple of other people. It's fascinating to me because Tolkien developed middle earth on an incredible level and then uh professor barker developed tecamel on an incredible level and they're both linguists so it always makes me wonder you know is there something about studying linguistics that leads to a a, a style of thinking that leads to incredibly rich world building but uh (laughs) Hopefully, I know I'm in a game with Victor at North Texas, so I hope we're in the same one. There's nothing I love more than to be creeped out and or uh, die horribly in a in a Victor Raymond game of Tecamel. So, uh, <laughs> I, I survived, actually. Mine. Yeah, well, I survived the last one that we were in um, when that creepy little girl was like, we didn't know if she was undead or not. I think that's the last game I've played in. <laughs> Um, no, no, I think, did I see, I know, I know the compound got like attacked at the end, but any, but anyway, I digress. Um, <laughs> hopefully we're in the same game and the, the Tecabell miniatures yes, so is too. a lot of fun too. Yeah. Rob Smith and company run really good Tecabell miniatures war gaming at North Texas as well. Maybe the first or second Gen Con my dad and I went to, uh, we watched, we couldn't get in, but we watched M.A.R. Barker run, uh, Empire of the Petal Throne. And we just stood there and and he was the, the best dungeon master I've ever seen. Uh, so so immersive and and so so gleefully um I- enjoyed uh, making things difficult for his players. <laughs> but uh yeah, fascinating man. Yeah, there was uh he ran a Tuesday and a Thursday night game. They were different games, different campaigns, but he played every Tuesday and every Thursday with wow. people at his college. And that's how Victor Raymond got to know him. And uh, every I've talked to two or three people that were actually in his games. 
and said they were just, you know, amazing. So anyway, uh, yeah, and I was going to say just to give a shout out to Jeff D., who, of course, Villains of Vigilantes, uh, f- famous for his old school Dungeons and Dragons art. He's a huge Tecumel fan, and he's got Baythorn, the Plane of Tecumel RPG. So there's a lot of different RPG systems that play in Tecumel. There's a lot. Um, so if you're interested in checking it out, um, I recommend it. I've got a couple of podcasts out there where I've tried to do kind of a deep dive into what it's all about, and it's fascinating stuff. So, But uh, I'm sure I'll see you at North Texas, but hopefully we'll get to play together again. So, Yeah, I think so. I want to get into a little bit more... Uh, I know you said you were bringing your your father's bibliography and everything. Before we kind of move over into that, uh, is there anything else that you kind of wanted to share about, you know, what what you're currently doing or hoping to do or uh, just just anything Chris Holmes? Like I said, we're not just here to talk about your dad. I'm done with me. I've <laughs> okay. You're I haven't done. talked about myself this much in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, wow, I'm done. Uh, <laughs> I have a short biography of Igarice Burroughs here. Okay. Well, we'll, hold on. I definitely want to get into that. First, I want to recommend, again, people go to uh, holmeswest.com. I'll have the links in the show notes. Folks, go to shameplays.com, and I'll have the show notes up uh, with links and stuff to topics we're talking about today. But uh, Chris does have a website up. Uh, He's got his art. He's got some stuff about his dad. Uh, I have my dad's um, book collection, which you could, uh, if you want to try to buy one of my dad's books, you can uh, check out what I'm asking for them. Okay. And that, yeah, there is a, the books of John Eric Holmes. And then also, and this is very important. Um, this, this is probably one of the most important things on the internet. Ask Cthulhu. So you can <laughs> no. submit a question to Cthulhu. And Cthulhu will answer you. Uh, and the example is Archie Andrews sent in a question, said he can't bes- decide between Betty and Veronica and was asking Cthulhu what to do. And uh, mm-hmm. and Cthulhu answers. So you can, folks, you can submit a question to Cthulhu and Cthulhu will answer uh, on, on, the, uh, on the Cthulhu question mark section of Holmes West. So go check that out. But you may lose sanity. You you will lose sanity. I've already lost sanity just by <laughs> okay. uh, by pulling it up. Yeah. So uh, it says if you submit a question, it may show up on this website. You are okay with this? Yes. If your answer is no, then do not submit a question. But then the question will not your mind until you finally go insane and then fall victim to a small rodent with a human face going <laughs> by the name Brown Jenkins. So yeah, you're 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 screwed either way. <laughs> so. Yeah, folks, go check that out. Uh, all right, so tell us a little bit about Edgar Rice Burroughs and, and your father's work in the ERB universe. <laughs> okay, so Edgar Rice Burroughs, uh, he's old. He uh, was born in 1912. <laughs> what a way he's... to start the biography. <laughs> I'm riveted. He's probably... Uh, in his lifetime, he's probably the most successful writer uh, in it uh, on Earth during his lifetime, and certainly the most prolific. And uh, so he wrote twenty-seven Tarzan books, eleven Barsoom books, seven Pellucidar books, and then another uh, mm, probably sixty novels of various types. Anyway, uh, so that's just crazy. And um, his stuff is. Uh, Influenced most of our major um, pulp writers. Uh, almost everybody likes him except for Tolkien and Lovecraft. They're the, like the only two writers I could find who did not like Edgar Rice Burroughs. But, Interesting. Um, Fritz Leiber and uh, Philip Jose Farmer liked him so much that they wrote uh, prequels or sequels uh, to Tarzan's, uh, well, what's it called? Opar series which is a, uh, a lost world where people ride around on triceratopses, I think. Which uh, is important. And he also, yeah. Let's, let's, let's just highlight that. That's important. <laughs> Burroughs was also probably a very big influence on uh, Robert E. Howard. So uh, there's a, um, a lot of things in common between Tarzan and Conan. And uh, 
My father was lucky enough to uh, meet Edgar Rice Burroughs when my father was a 12-year-old boy in Hawaii, and uh, Burroughs was staying at the uh, the one big hotel that was there at the time in Honolulu. So he got my father got uh, Burroughs' signature and sort of got inspired to think about uh, writing in the Burroughs universe. So that's uh, that's Edgar Rice Burroughs in a nutshell. I, I, I'm just warning you that you may encounter a little bit of uh, racism in some of his books, particularly the Tarzan books. But um, most of it I didn't notice when I was having them read aloud to me as a child, and it didn't turn me into a racist. So, yeah, of course, there's, there's, we talk about stuff being of its times. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Lovecraft catches heat. Um, the uh, a lot of the pulp writers catch heat. Uh, so, it you know, it's it, you're going to run into it. Um, like one of the things that, you know, you were talking about, we were talking about before we started recording, you know, you went on the Appendix N Book Club podcast. And that's a great podcast. Uh, they, they really could do a good deep dive on pulp books. Uh, but they always spend a, a, quite a bit of time talking about, you know, this this element of the book today people would have problems with. Uh, so just go in with your eyes open. You know, it, it's not, it's not like you said, they're not like racist handbooks. Uh, they're not like <laughs> no. trying to turn you into a racist. So do you have a personal favorite Edgar Rice Burroughs, uh, <laughs> short story or book? Oh, I, I would recommend, um, princess of Mars at the earth's core, which is the first Pellucidar novel. Chessmen of Mars is one of my favorites. It has a, a, a monster race in it that is really weird uh, and very interesting. And um, Tarzan at the Earth's Core is a great, fun book. Um, I love that. I love the crossover. A, yeah. yeah, it well is the probably the first crossover ever created, and uh, Tarzan may have been the first superhero ever created because he has. He's a, definitely a proto superhero. Yeah. Well, he has a superpower. He has super smell, which which makes no sense. And this is very Burroughsy <laughs> to have your your yeah. your character have uh, no no rationale for something that they can do that's very useful to them. Uh, so he can smell Jane, his wife, anywhere she's kidnapped, anywhere on the world. He can follow her her scent trail, and he can also tell things about you depending on you know how your sweat smells, like whether you're lying or whether you're hiding. That is super yeah, smell. He, he can smell you through a wall. <laughs> okay, that's a superpower. I, yeah, I'm sold. I'm, I'm, I, I just dropped the gavel. Sold. He's got. That was one of the first superpowers. Right. Oh, John Carter can jump around uh, like, uh, like a superhero, but that's because he's an Earthman on Mars, and there's less on gravity, Mars with but he, different, right, different. Gravity. But he is the greatest swordsman in two worlds, so uh, he's got that going for him too. Well, I would argue that Tarzan has another superpower um, of super intelligence because in the first Tarzan book, he completely learns not just English, but amazingly <laughs> yeah. good, by just looking at like one, you know, like by reading a, a diary or something and his brain, the longer he looks at it, suddenly he understands English, you know, and then he understands <laughs> yeah. English enough that he's running around Europe. So, um <laughs> You know. Yeah, he does do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to give him super linguistics, too. Um, well, all of uh, Burroughs' characters actually are great at, le- at learning languages. They can learn a language right. in a chapter quite, quite well, quickly. Well, you have to, right? <laughs> yeah. Your father wrote the official uh, sequel to the first Buck Rogers novel, and I think it was called Mordred? Is that right? It, Let me look here. That's what they uh, sold it as. Yeah. That's the one I want you to save your money on that one is my recommendation. Spend not, your money not a fan. on. I say spend your money on Maharza Pellucidar and Red Axe of Pellucidar. Yeah. He, well, he wasn't as happy because they, uh, they edited his, um, his version of it and then, the, you know, didn't ask him what he thought of their editing. <laughs> they just printed it. So it was not a, right. uh, not a great experience for him. So he wasn't pleased when he, when he saw the the changes. Um, yeah, he actually had some difficulty getting Mahars printed. Uh, it wasn't uh, 
they initially rejected it, and then uh, he pointed out to them that they they had just printed a Fritz Leiber, um, so they were printing sequels to Burroughs's work, although they told them they weren't. And then uh, but, but, somebody but I else see right uh, here. You are, yeah. And then somebody else at the uh, uh, one, I think Burroughs's grandson Hulbert read uh, my dad's manuscript and said, "This is really good. We should print it." So, thanks to him, Mahars uh, was printed. All right, so you have Mahars of, is it Pellucidar or Pellucidar? I want to make sure I'm saying it right. Pellucidar, yeah. it's a Pellucidar, okay, so it's a soft C. Soft C, C. The, yeah. Soft, in the, in the key of soft. Uh, Red Axe <laughs> of Pellucidar, which originally he wrote, they accepted it, but then didn't publish it. But then it got republished fairly recently, or published for the first time, or, or something along those lines. Is that right? No, they did. They did not publish it. Uh, some uh, bootleg copies snuck out, but um, the person, the the family member, or the person who is in charge of Edgar's Burroughs Incorporated changes uh, over time. So the uh, the guy who printed Mahars was no longer in charge, and the person who took over didn't want to print Red Axe because Mahars didn't sell very well, and I think. Red Axe would have sold better, partly because the nobody knows what a Mahar is, but right. uh, and Red Axe is is a good catchy title, but yeah, it really is. Yeah, no, I, I, I can see that. Um, <laughs> but it did finally get some years back a, a, an official publication last correct? year. Yeah, <laughs> last year, and then you had a, yeah. you have artwork in that. Okay, I do. So for for Swordsman of Pellucidar which I'm showing was unfinished. Uh, how, how far along is the book? Like how much of the book exists? The what title. State is it in? <laughs> That's it. Okay. That's, yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah, there's, the it's exist- not like you could. <laughs> All right. No, somebody can use that title if they want. Uh, okay. I'm, so, I'm not going to do it. Right. Yeah. Sorry about that one. folks. Right. <laughs> so your father was a neurologist he was actually like a professor, I believe, or uh, of of neurology. I'm assuming. How did he? Yeah, end he up, taught. So, how did your father go? Like, end up approaching TSR and and pitching the basic set. And was he ever actually a direct employee of TSR, or did he just do this on a freelance or contract basis? Like, what happened? <laughs> Uh, well, he he wrote them a letter because uh, when we learned how to play Dungeons and Dragons, uh, he felt like he didn't quite get a very good introduction. So he bought all the books and tried to figure it out on his own. And he still felt that it was really difficult and that somebody should write a beginner's guide to Dungeons and Dragons. So uh, that was he he wrote them a letter and said, you know, would you uh, I'm a. Uh, professor and I'm a pulp science fiction writer. Would you consider uh, letting me write a beginner's guide? And they, uh, I think they called him back. And, and anyway, they said, "Yeah, we were thinking about something like that. Uh, we, uh, you can do that uh, for us, but we can't pay you. We don't have any money, but we'll um, <laughs> we'll give you free we'll give you free games. So will you do it for nothing?" And uh, uh, and he said, "Sure." <laughs> it's 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 not funny it's just the way you're presenting it is great you're like yeah okay. sure <laughs> pretty much well he uh he did have a day job luckily and my dad was kind of a rich kid so he wasn't really used to asking for money so right uh, yeah no he he made no money and he was not an employee he was honored at uh a dinner but um and he did get free games, but that's it. So, so he got free game, like free games, not just free copies of his own basic set, but like free games from TSR in general. Yeah, we got uh, you know awful green things from outer space, and we got Marvel superheroes, and it was cool. That is cool. But, um, so he, he could have so got he, a million they, dollars, but he didn't. Yeah, I mean, after it became a somewhat successful product, um, you think that. Maybe something could have been worked out, but anyway, I, I, I from what it sounds like to me is your dad did it because he wanted to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of a yep. love of the 
game, the product. So, um, <laughs> and now, I mean, he's, you know, he's held in high regard among, yeah. you know, enthusiasts and historians. You can't buy, that's hard to buy. You know what I mean? To earn your <laughs> oh, yeah, place. It's pa- it certainly history. paid off for me, but it, yeah, I, yeah, I think he enjoyed, uh, he enjoyed the little bit of notoriety it got him. Yeah. Right. Um, so do, do you remember, cause I, I do not, I remember BX when I was a little too young, when the basic 77 basic set dropped to really remember it. Uh, of course I, you know, I know about it in retrospect. What, do you remember what kind of, impact it had for players or in the hobby what kind of feedback he was getting uh i had no idea actually because they didn't tell us anything and we uh, you know we went to the convention and uh it was kind of hard to tell you know i mean they were for sale uh, and my dad did say that they sold a lot of copies but um they had no reason to tell him how many copies they were selling <laughs> So, uh, yeah, and they were sort of incentivized not to, if you think about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, now, this was also the edition um, or the box set that for a time, and I, I think the the general urban myth or consensus or whatever is it was because of a dice shortage. I've never verified that personally. But for a time, this box set didn't have dice in it. It came with little chits um yeah to ran to ran uh, your randomizer weren't dice they were little square pieces of cardboard with numbers on them basically so do you do you have any insight onto why that was <laughs> no i mean i've heard i've heard the story obviously <laughs> but yeah uh, the, the people who got the chits definitely uh got got a raw deal there <laughs> since um poly- polyhedra were rare apparently um and you had to make your own, you had to make your own twenty sider by coloring every other um, face right. red yeah. or something, or writing. With, well, my dad wrote with a little tiny rapidograph pen a one next to every other digit to make it a tens column. Right. Yeah. They uh, the twenty siders of the time I think had zero to nine repeated twice. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. Another way to do it is uh, I, I found in recent years, one of the ways that people did it was they would roll like the 20 sider and a six sider at the same time. And then if the six yeah. sider came up odd, then I think it was a tens and if it, or a, a ones. And if it came up even, then it was in the tens or whatever. Mm-hmm. So that was another way people had of doing it. But yeah, like some games would come with a little wax pencil or you know, a like crayon. a crayon yeah. or something, yeah, to to color in stuff. So yeah. Um, so do you personally uh, have a favorite edition of of Dungeons and Dragons? To to just throw the spotlight on you, since your dad wrote one of them, I'm just going to put you under the gun. What's your What's your favorite, Chris? I'm sure your dad's listening. <laughs> well, they all have big problems. I I can criticize them all. <laughs> I've never gotten that answer. No, I got to back up. That was beautiful because people are always like, well, they all have strong points, but you're like, no, they've all got problems. <laughs> it's true though, isn't it? I don't right, know. That's, maybe that's my personality. <laughs> Which one do you think has the least amount of problems? <laughs> I don't, well, I don't own any of them, so I can't really tell you. I have the advanced Dungeons and Dragons books. And I have my dad's blue book, but I don't own Mulvey Cook or um, or Menser, so I can't really say. My dad wrote a review yeah. of uh, Mulvey Cook, uh, and uh, it was a very positive review. I think yeah. variable dice damage is something I really enjoy. Uh, I like uh, arrows being a one to four, and I like you know um, some some weapons doing one d eight damage. I, I I enjoy that for some reason. It just feels right to me. So that's the one thing that Holmes Basic is missing. But. Well, I think that, but he he drew that because Holmes Basic was sort of a aggregated 
ver- cleaned up, edited version of OD and D plus some of its supplements, right? Yeah, he tried not to add anything of his own. He tried to uh, be very faithful uh, to the right. to the books and uh, also to Chainmail. I guess he got a little bit of material from Chainmail. And uh, so, in the old days, uh, in the old days, Chris. Uh, can you hand me my Geritol? Um, the uh, mm-hmm. all all weapons did one d six, isn't that right? Isn't that what you're referring to? Yeah, and then except later the, they changed it up. Yeah, I, we never played that way though, uh, because the we had a weird uh, Caltech version of the rules that that uh, we were taught. So we just uh, kept critical hits and we kept variable dice damage, and, and then. Uh, added uh, the uh, basic uh, D20 uh, combat system. Okay. Um, all right. So, yeah, even I mean, even at the very... And this is a debate that goes on all the time, but even at the very beginning, before Holmes Basic was even written, uh, everybody had their own house rules. Caltech mm-hmm. had house rules. I had a house. They had a house. Everybody had a house rule. Um and, and, and different different ways of doing it. So uh, so when you go to the Boys and Girls Club, are you running 5th edition? What are you running there? Oh, God, no. No. It's too, <laughs> it's too much work. <laughs> okay, here's my metaphor for 5th edition. When I was a tourist and I go to another country, they'd have these restaurants that were tourist-friendly – and so they'd have French food, English food, American food, Japanese food, Chinese food. They'd have all the stuff on your menu. And your menu would be just telephone book size. And then uh, so you'd waste all this time making all these choices. And then the, and then in the end, you'd be confused and you wouldn't remember. You know, it was just it wasn't worth it. And that's fifth edition. It's just too many choices and they're and they're not worth the trouble. So what are you running then? Are you just running your own version of like an old basic? So for the uh, yeah, so for the for the uh, middle school kids who are first playing, I run Chris Holmes's weird version of Holmes Basic, and for the uh, high school kids, I run Chris Holmes' weird version of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. And, but occasionally a kid will come along and say, I want to run 5th edition. And I'll go, okay, I can't stop you. Um, I'm supposed to support you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so I put up with it. <laughs> <laughs> and I do, like the, I do like the advantage-disadvantage mechanic. Just uh, the, the advantage-disadvantage mechanic is a very nice, elegant mechanic. Uh, yes. I mean, I, I listen. People, it's 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 a very nice, elegant com- uh, mechanic. I can't argue against it um, at all. Uh, I actually run for my group, my weekly group. We run Five E because I started running in 2015 DMing at a local game store that needed DMs. So I was running Five E mm-hmm. for the store to help the store sell stuff, um, and then the store ended up closing during covid so we moved it here to the house and we've just stayed on 5e but i've, I've well, already if it brings you I'm joy like, then i'm happy for you yeah it's i'm it's happy fine. for you shane uh, if you enjoy it <laughs> you you support my choices no matter how terrible they are uh so <laughs> sure. um if it- it's uh but I've already decided, our group's already decided, it, it, I'm not jumping onto whatever the next thing from Wizards of the Coast is. Whatever D&D Next mm-hmm. or 1 or D&D 6, whatever, whatever they're calling it, we're, we're done. Uh, there's too many other systems yeah. out there I want to play. So, um, and, they're, and they're waiting for better or for worse. I am not opining. I'm simply saying that there's too much culture war in my gaming. Um, and I, and, and, and I just want to play games. So, um, yeah. Anyway. And yeah. play a half so, elf if you want to. If you want to, by goodness. Um, <laughs> yes. yeah. 
So, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's just the latest controversy. Uh, and then I uh, guess <laughs> poor Wizards of the Coast. Well, not poor Wizards of the Coast, but you know the corporation <laughs> making their own decisions. So they're they're having they're having crisis after crisis. I'm sure you saw where Wizards of the Coast just sent Pinkerton agents to this guy's house, right? I just saw that today. Yeah, I didn't read it, but yeah, I will. <laughs> yeah. So evidently, uh, somebody somehow had adva- had magic cards in advance of the release and was sharing them online. I don't know anything. I don't know if it was unintentional, intentional. I don't know how he got. I know nothing. He could have been completely ignorant of what he was doing was wrong. I don't know. But Pinkerton agents showed up at his house. So all these uh, smaller third party publishers are being snarky and like, you know, we haven't used uh, like Troll Lord Games is like Pinkerton free since 1890. (laughs) Like other small. (laughs) Anyway. That's funny. Uh, yeah, so even if they were in the right legally to go send Pinkerton agents to check out these cards or whatever, it's just not a good look right now for them. Uh, it's <laughs> just it's just bad. <laughs> they just they're they are stepping on landmines. They're rolling they're they're rolling ones left and right, man. So <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> they need to purge that company a little. <laughs> Something. I don't know what's going on, man. Because uh, they're definitely snatching defeat from the jaws of victory because 5th edition has been their <laughs> best selling. I mean, D&D, the, the, the uh, penetration in the mainstream is huge. 5th uh, edition selling like not just gangbusters, but like super gangbusters on steroids. And and then now they're just, I don't know what they're doing. So, um, so you play... Uh, I want to wrap up on this. Uh, you you play transmogrified home rule versions of Holmes Basic and AD and D First Edition, which is cool. I salute you for that. Um, mm-hmm. I there's a there's a huge part of me that's basically OSR. Uh, although I I'm very system promiscuous. I'll try any system once. I love to I love to see oh, the math and all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's why I, that's one of the reasons I love conventions is playing stuff I never get to play. Um, so, uh, I know you play various, or at least one version of tech, maybe this, what is it? Swords and sorcery. There's a, there's tech ML that, uh, TSR empire of the pedal throne released way back. Everyone calls it tech ML, but it's actually swords and something. It's a modified version of, uh, OD and D. So I know you play that. Mm-hmm. Do you have any other systems oh, I just that play, you like? I, sorry, let me interrupt. I, I just play with Victor. So for okay. me, uh, so you play Victor. You play the Victor. I, yeah, I don't. I don't care about rules as much as I care about the dungeon master. So, if I find a dungeon master who I love, I just stick with them, and they can run whatever they want. Uh, you know, I play Boot Hill with Victor, or I play, play you know play anything with Dennis Sustar. I play uh, just you know the dungeon master is the most important, and then the players, and then the the rule sets of tertiary importance to me. Well, see, but but in this climate, in this current day and age, you're not supposed to imply that the actual DM or GM is important <laughs> to the game. Okay. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm old and cranky. That's, I mean, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are. We're yelling at clouds and loving it. Um, mm-hmm. So, all right. Well, is there any other... Dungeon masters, referees, GMs, and or game systems, or novels, or anything <laughs> that you want. Do, do you want to give a shout out to before we wrap up this lovely discussion? Wow. Um, I, no, I, I. Yeah, Poke Black Bay Publishing. Try to get Tales of Peril back up. Um, yeah. Uh, but yes, I'm very, uh, very grateful for Alan for bringing me into the world of the OSR. And uh, Alan, Alan is a cool dude. I can't. My uh, opinion is a nice guy. Yeah. You're all cool dudes. There's I've met so many cool dudes and gals <laughs> at um, yeah. uh, in the OSR. Dudes I'm and dudes. Very happy. Yeah. Just very happy to be part of it. I, I like to end my. Oh, and I want to say that you've mentioned before. I know that you're into movies 
and some of the other topics of this show you're into and want to come on and talk about. So we'll have next time I do a, a movie podcast or, or something, I'll have you on. So I know like when Levi zombies. and I were talking about Grindhouse. Yeah, zombie movies. I just watched. Maybe um, with um, Mike, Mike Stewart might do zombies with us too. Might be fun. Yeah, is he a big zombie movie aficionado? Yeah, at the any time he interviews me or something, I he afterwards he's like he like asked me a zombie question or whatever. So, oh okay, yeah. I don't know. I like Mike a lot. Um, I've had him on, and I'm in his uh, Victorious game in North Texas. But, um, so I just watched um, again. I'd seen it before, but I watched it again. Zombie by Fulci, uh, which of course has the amazing underwater zombie versus shark scene. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then uh, I watched the, because Joe Bob just had the most recent episode of Joe Bob. They, they covered uh zombie and they covered uh, the beyond both by Fulci. And they had, I can't remember his name, Fabro Fritchie, I think. I don't know that the musician for the movies was on the show. Um, oh, neat. And then that made me, and that, that got me, cause I'd never seen the beyond before. And then I went oh, yeah, and watched I think it's pretty City good. of It is good. Yeah, I mean it's it's great. Um I, I think it's a, other than the zombie versus shark scene, I think that the Beyond and City of the Dead are actually superior to zombie. But you know, <laughs> other people's mileage may vary. Um anyway, yeah, so I just had a I had a, a Fulci zombie trifecta. Um uh, nice over the, you know, over the past over the past few days. So yeah, we'll do a zombie movie. You show. and the kids, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my son <laughs> seemed riveted. He was speechless. He was so into it. Uh, He'll thank you later. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll get at the therapy bill. No, I'm, obviously, I don't expose my child to... I see, like, on Facebook, I, I belong to some, uh, like, Joe Bob Facebook group and, you know, movie Facebook groups. And people will brag about taking their little kids to these, like, intense horror movies. And I, I don't get that. But that's their, you know... That's their business, not mine. I just don't get it. So, they're like, I introduced my yeah. four year old to, you know, uh, what, you know, whatever. I'm like, what the, what are you even House doing? of a Thousand Corpses. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he loved it. Yeah. Kids like petrified. So, anyway. Um, and I, since you mentioned House of a Thousand Corpses, I'm going to go out. I'm just going to say publicly, I do not dislike Rob Zombie's movies there. There's this huge <laughs> hate for Rob Zombie's well, movies do, for some reason. So let's fight. <laughs> well, we're fighting. I'm, we're going to yeah. have a bare knuckle just, cage match. He needs to stick to yeah. music. <laughs> <laughs> he needs to stick to, need the, to, to the heavy death metal. <laughs> so what you're saying is multiple editions of D&D have many, many problems. And all of they Rob do. Zombie's movies just have many, many problems. Okay. All right. Sure, I'll I haven't st- seen I'll the monsters yet. You know, he didn't. No, uh, it's probably terrible. <laughs> probably, <laughs> dude. You need to do a stand-up routine. It's just this deadpan. Everything's <laughs> terrible. It's funny. Well, you know what? The interesting thing about the monsters was the TV show wasn't any good either. So let's just forget the monsters <laughs> ever happened. <laughs> Dude, you need to do a stand-up routine. You really do. So, all okay, right. they had a cool so, car. That was about it for that show. <laughs> yeah, Dra- Dragula. Rob Zombie sang a song about it. Um, That's a good right, song. So I like that song. It 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 is a good song. Dig, digging ditches and witches, and I don't know what all's going on, but but Dragula's involved somehow. So um, <laughs> that was Grandpa Grandpa Munster's drag racer was Dragula instead of Dracula. So. Okay. All right. I always, I know you've listened to the show before, so that you know that I, I always end the show with a bad joke of the week. Even though the okay. podcast isn't weekly, it just has a nice ring to it. So, have you heard about the restaurant on the moon? I have not. Great food, no atmosphere. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to thank me. You're supposed to rail at me. You're supposed to say, Shane, that joke, that joke has many, many problems. <laughs> okay. To... <laughs> Speaking of zombies. You've given me a new right, catchphrase. <laughs> All right. I, I, have, I now has... have a new catchphrase, thanks to you. It has Thank many, you. many, many problems. Okay, here's a zombie bad joke for you. You ready? Oh, okay. Two jokes. <laughs> yeah. How, how do zombies eat computers? 
Uh, I don't know, one bit at a time? No, close, but they use megabytes. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. I like the moon one better. Yeah, you like the moon better? All right. Well, I mean, but you're a big zombie person, so I was was throwing (laughs) zombies in there. Thanks for throwing zombies at me. No problem. It's one of my favorite things to do. Okay, so I'm going to wrap us up here, folks. Uh, great discussion with Chris Holmes. Uh, cool dude. Uh, saving saving the world one teenager at a time with D and D. Aw, you too. Aw, yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm just saving the world with my super <laughs> smell. But you you have a superpower where you play D and D with teenagers and, and middle schoolers. So. Uh, don't forget, um, you know, uh, Chris is out there doing his own thing with very cool art. So keep an eye out for that. Um, don't forget about his father's books. He has a pretty good bibliography going there. Go to Chris Holmes or no, HolmesWest.com. Go to HolmesWest.com. Go to ShamePlays.com. There'll be show notes. There's a list of books from John Eric Holmes' personal library that you could potentially purchase if you're so inclined. And don't forget about... Uh, things better left alone, or as I like to call it, yes. don't poke it. Uh, the module mm-hmm. dropping from Pace Setter Games, June 1st, it'll be at um, North Texas RPG Con uh, or on the Pace Setter Games website. And that is a uh, a module with 113 encounters based around a map that John Eric's Holmes, John Eric's, John Eric Holmes mm-hmm. drew. And John Eric Holmes, of course, is the creator of or not the creator the the author slash editor of holmes basic D, which came out in 1977 would you like to add anything to that mr holmes that was great shane no thank you yep all right i'm gonna you know what i just realized mr <laughs> holmes so from now on when uh when i'm at a gaming table with you chris i'm gonna look over at you and i'm gonna say the game's afoot mr holmes <laughs> Quick, get the needle. <laughs> I don't get that reference. What? Oh, uh, sorry. It's a Sherlock Holmes reference. <laughs> is that is that a Sherlock Holmes reference? I have yeah, read a, a lot of Sherlock Holmes, but I haven't read everything. Oh, okay. Well, he um, says it at, at the end of the Basil Rathbone, um, Hound of the Baskervilles movie, oh, but they edited it the out of some versions. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because it's a cocaine reference. Oh, uh, yeah, because in the books, back in the day, cocaine wasn't viewed with uh, such public hate or whatever. Uh, and in the books, in the novel, the short stories and stuff, uh, Mr. Holmes liked his his uh, his bit of cocaine, did Holmes. So um, Well, he hated boredom. Yeah, well, that's the reason he saw people. He wasn't necessarily a good guy. He wasn't a bad guy, but he wasn't necessarily a good guy. He was bored, which is why he liked to solve the mysteries. Uh, <laughs> Sounds like we need to do another have podcast. A, <laughs> we really do. Yeah, he would, uh, <laughs> if he didn't have a mystery to solve, like he would sit in his apartment and fire a revolver at the walls. I mean, he would go nuts. So anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and he never wore the deerstalker cap. That's like a hunting cap. But somehow, mm. I think because of the movies, it became associated with him. So, anyway, all right, Chris, it's been great. Thanks so much for coming on. We will have you on again. We'll talk about zombies and, and other good stuff. And in the meantime, Yay. Um, good luck with all your various endeavors. And I look forward to seeing things better left alone in your art. Yeah, me too. <laughs> all right, man. Everybody else, we will catch you next time on Shane Place. Thanks so much for listening to Shane Plays Geek Talk. I certainly hope you enjoyed this journey into the things we love. For your convenience, show notes with helpful links for each episode can always be found at shaneplays.com. You can catch the podcast in several places, including on the blog at shaneplays.com, iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, Podbean, Amazon Music, Verbal, YouTube, and more. If you like what you hear and would like to support Shane Plays Geek Talk, You can do so for as little as $1 per episode on Patreon at patreon.com slash shameplays. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Stay geeky, my friends.